Sunday, we normally sing that hymn later and only two verses of it, but the reason that I put it where I did today is because we never sing the other three verses, and they have some marvelous truth in them that we need to be reminded of. Please take your Bibles and turn with me, if you will, to Hebrews chapter 10, which is where we're going to be today, rather than in part six of our series on Exodus. We're in Hebrews chapter 10. Now you recall that last Sunday was Memorial Day Sunday and so we looked at Exodus chapter 3 verse 15 where God said unto Moses, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob hath sent me unto you. This is my name forever and this is my memorial unto all generations. We looked at the history of Memorial Day also called Decoration Day which tracks back to the Civil War. We saw that human memorials are designed for four different things, to remind the living about the dead in four ways. Number one, to keep us on guard. Number two, to make sure that the lessons of the past are learned well. 
Number three, to keep us from repeating the mistakes of former generations. And number four, to give us a sense of continuity of our identity as a people. But we saw that divine memorials, and this certainly ties us in with today, as we partake of a memorial of the Lord's table, the divine memorials have a far deeper purpose. We covered 15 of those last week, very briefly. Divine memorials remind us about the character of God. Divine memorials remind us about the works of God. Divine memorials remind us about the law of God. Divine memorials remind us about the word of God. Divine memorials remind us of the holy service that we as God's holy people are obligated to do. And we'll spend some time on that in this text in Hebrews this morning. Divine memorials also remind us of our right of access into the divine presence by the blood of Christ, which we memorialize today. Divine memorials remind us of the cost of redemption by the blood of Christ. Divine memorials remind us of God's promise of the regathering of Israel to its homeland in preparation for the return of Christ at his second coming. Major prophecies of the Old Testament speaking of that as a memorial that God has set forth. Divine memorials remind us of the typology of Christ as the bread of life and of his deity. And we'll be speaking of him this morning as the one who is the bread come down from heaven as we partake of the bread here. Divine memorials show us that God will not accept unholy service or service by the unbeliever. And if you've been with us on Sunday evenings, we've been talking about the service of worship and why we call this the morning worship service or the evening worship service tonight is because worship is divine service. And we'll be talking about that somewhat today too. It all ties together. Divine memorials remind us that God will not accept unholy service or the service of the unbeliever. Divine memorials remind us of our obligation to bring of our best offerings to the Lord, not that which is second rate, not that which is defective, but our very best. Divine memorials remind us of the omnipotent power and mighty acts of God on behalf of his people, and we saw that in Joshua chapter 4. Divine memorials remind God's people that we are to be a separated people. This church has had a history of that, but I wonder how true it is today for us. It's a very key doctrine in Scripture. Divine memorials remind God's people that he will destroy their enemies before them and protect them. And divine memorials remind God's people that human memorials perish, but divine memorials are everlasting. Thy name, O Lord, endureth forever, and thy memorial, O Lord, throughout all generations. The memory of the just is blessed, but the name of the wicked shall rot. You recall we talked about cemeteries, walking through cemeteries. When we had Presbytery just a couple of months ago, I walked through that old, old cemetery down there in Marcus Hook, some of them dating back to the Revolution, those tombstones, and looked at them and I thought, you can hardly even read the names that are there. There's a stone standing upright in the ground. Many of them have fallen over. Many of the names are totally obliterated. No one remembers them. And we talked about how that will be true of us. When you die, you will also soon be forgotten. And that's why the scripture exhorts us to do something in this life that will be established for all of eternity. Otherwise, you are wasting your life. Oh, that we might learn to number our days and apply our hearts unto wisdom. The memory of the just is blessed, but the name of the wicked shall rot. Then we saw that divine memorials remind God's people that the Lord himself is our Memorial. That's a memorial that will never decay and never fall down. The name will never be obliterated or blotted out. It will not crumble to dust. The name of the Lord endures forever. And the scripture tells us, even the Lord of hosts, the Lord is his memorial. And then, of course, we gather together today to celebrate the memorial of our Lord.
Lord Jesus Christ. He took bread and gave thanks and break it and gave unto them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. This is a memorial. This is not an actual sacrifice. Roman Catholicism teaches that you're partaking of a sacrifice of Christ and that the priest is sacrificing Christ every time he elevates the host. Jesus said, do this in remembrance. That's a memorial of me. And that's the way Paul cites it in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Now, some of you were not here on Friday evening. In fact, most were not here on Friday evening where I spoke on the cross and sanctification. God has called us to a life of holiness. A life, not a sporadic punctuation of holiness, but a life of holiness. We are to be holy because the Lord our God is holy. And someday this one who is the Holy One will come to judge the earth. Only holy living will be prepared at the moment that Christ returns. If you're living 90% of your life in a way that is not holy before a holy God, you want to know what the odds are that Christ will return and you will not be prepared? Listen to what Peter says in 2 Peter 3, 9 through 14. The Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord is, will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Now, on the basis of the fact that this world is temporal, on the basis of this fact that this world is going to burn up someday, why do you spend so much time and love on this world? That's what Peter says in the very next verse. Seeing then that all these things, everything that you can see, all of the earth around you, all of the good stuff that you want to buy. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? What kind of a person should you be in light of the fact this world is going to burn up? You should be a person that lives a life of holy conversation and godliness. He goes on and describes the dissolving of the elements, melting with a fervent heat. And then he says, Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless. What counts is not here, all the stuff that we can gather to ourselves, or like the bumper sticker says, the guy that dies with the most toys wins. No, he doesn't. The one who lives a holy life, a life filled with godliness, a life filled with peace, a life filled without spot and blameless, is the call that God has placed upon you and upon me. Many years ago when I was in college, I read a book that really changed my life. I already was headed this direction, but it certainly galvanized me to it. It's called A Serious Call to a Devout and Holy Life by William Law. A couple of hundred years old, but certainly applicable today. A Serious Call to a Devout and Holy Life. What manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness, without spot and blameless? The cross and sanctification. As we noted a minute ago, most of you missed the preparatory service this past Friday evening. Some of you may be here today 
And God put that on my heart in the prayer, as you know, a few minutes ago. You may be present here today without having your hearts truly prepared for the Lord's table. Because I believe that it is absolutely critical and crucial for us to be right with God before we partake of the Lord's table, I'm going to expand on and repeat some things that we meditated on on Friday evening. Dear people, this is a memorial of Christ's death. We've been through it so many times, we tend to sort of ignore that fact or just pass it off lightly. First, we need to know what we're talking about. When we have the word sanctify or sanctification showing up in Scripture, what does it mean? Very simply and very briefly, it means to be set apart for God's holy service. Sanctification, holiness. When you read the word holy, you're talking about that which is sanctified. That which is set apart for God's holy service. Those of you who have been attending on Sunday evening know that we have been talking about the worship service in the tabernacle and in the temple. And by way of comparison, the worship service of the church. Our worship is to be holy worship. We are set apart positionally and practically, therefore our worship should be different from the types of things that the world around us does. Especially when we are gathered here, it should be different from the way we are, theoretically, out there in the world. Now for the Christian, all of life is holy service. But certainly when you are here, do you not understand a difference from what is out there? Our positional sanctification as we discussed on Friday evening is how God sees us in Christ. That's where you are in Christ in the heavenlies, Ephesians chapter 1. That's the way that God sees you as perfected in Him. Your works have nothing to do with your salvation. Your works have nothing to do with your sanctification. In Christ, you are there in Christ in the heavenlies. That's how God sees you through Him, through the lens of His Son. But our practical sanctification is the day-by-day -day living of a holy life. In the power of the Holy Spirit of God. Why do you think He's called the Holy Spirit? Spirit. Because God is a holy God. In the power of the Holy Spirit of God and to the glory of God, our holy worship must therefore be actual service to the living God and not merely something that pleases the flesh and makes us feel comfortable. The modern evangelical American church has forgotten that the purpose for church is not to make you feel good. It is to worship and serve a holy God whether we feel comfortable about it or not. You will never find anything in Scripture that says you are to come to church for entertainment. You will never find anything in Scripture that says you are to come to church to make yourself feel good. But you will find much in Scripture that says you are to come to worship before the holy feet of a holy living God and give Him your service. Why are you here today? Because it's habit? Because it's the routine on Sunday morning we go to church? Because that's why 
Christians are supposed to do it, and so I guess we're supposed to show up. Or are you here because God has called you here? Because God, the holy living God, is the one whom you worship and serve, and he has said that you are to be here on this place at this time. And you dare not disobey the living God. He has called you not to forsake the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhort one another, and so much the more as ye see the day approaching on the first day of the week. Let every one of you lay by him in store as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. They gathered on the first day of the week to celebrate the resurrection of Christ from the dead. We remember his death and celebrate his resurrection. Why are you here today? Because you had nothing else to do? Because the Sunday morning shows on TV are dull? Because you couldn't think of anything else and you happened to wake up early? Why are you here? If you're watching this over the internet, why aren't you in church? Do you have a genuine physical excuse for not being able to be here this day? Dear people, we need to understand the holiness of God. And he has called us to be a holy people. And we must come with clean hands and a pure heart to the table of Christ. When we gather for the service of communion, we remember that it is the blood of Christ that is the foundation and the ground of our holiness our sanctification. There is no holiness in the flesh. There is no holiness in the world. There is certainly no holiness among the devil and his demonic forces. The ground of our holiness, why we are made holy, is the blood of Jesus Christ. Those are the four verses I read a moment ago. Wherefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify, that is, make holy the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. That's the cross on Calvary, outside the city walls. It is the blood of Jesus Christ. We partake of the cup this morning, which reminds us of the blood that Christ shed not merely so that we could be saved, but so that we could be holy. How we trivialize our lives and waste them in foolishness instead of dedicating them to holy living for Christ every day of the week, every moment of every day. That he might sanctify the people, that is, that he might make holy the people with his own blood. And speaking of the will of God, it is the will of God for you to be holy. For it says in verse 10 of chapter 10, by the which will, this is the will of God, that we are sanctified, we are made holy, we are set apart through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. The first verse that I read spoke of his blood sanctifying us through his blood. This verse speaks of the offering of the body of Jesus Christ. The bread speaks to us of the body of Christ. He bore our sins in his own body on the tree. That we, being dead unto sin, should live unto righteousness. That's sanctification. That's the holy life should live unto righteousness. Are you doing it? Jesus Christ offered his body, which we remember in the bread, on the cross, to sanctify you, to make you holy, so that you could live unto righteousness, unto holiness, unto holy service to the living God. 
For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. We cannot add to it one offering. One offering. He has perfected forever them that are sanctified. That's how God sees you in Christ. Are you living that way? As you go about your routine through the week, when you get up the first thing in the morning, do you dedicate that day to Christ? As you get up and take your shower and get dressed, do you say, Gracious Father, show me what clothing I should wear today that I should not bring shame and reproach to Christ. So that I should not be a temptation for someone else to lust. So that I should not be weird and freaky even though I think it is cool. Is your clothing holy clothing? We'll talk about that in a moment because the scripture talks about it in the context of holiness. In the context of sanctification. One offering. Jesus did it, you don't. There is no holiness in the flesh. It is only as you live in the power of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God, that you can please Him. There are consequences for not doing it. Hebrews 10.29 of how much sorer punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy? Now let's put that in its context. In the preceding verse it tells us that he that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Someone who violated the law of God in the Old Testament and there were two or three witnesses that saw him and bore testimony against him, was brought out side of the camp, and the people stoned them with stones, the witnesses casting the first stone. And they were killed. Now, is that a serious punishment? In this life, we can hardly think of anything more serious or more painful. Being killed by being stoned with stones. That's the context of verse 29. Of how much sorer punishment, far worse punishment, far more sore, suppose ye shall he be thought worthy well, who could do something that would be worse than that? Well, here's what's worse than that. Who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God, and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified, by which he was made holy. He counts that blood of the covenant an unholy thing. He trivializes it. He counts it as nothing. He comes to the Lord's table unprepared. He comes with a heart that has not been cleansed by the blood of Christ. An unholy thing, and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. The one who is called the Holy Spirit is here called the Spirit of Grace. For it is the Spirit of God who takes the Word of God and applies it to our hearts so that we might understand our sin and then that Holy Spirit draws us to our Lord Jesus Christ wherein is the fullness of grace. Oh, we deserve death. 
We deserve punishment. How then can we despise the spirit of grace? God's unmerited favor to us. The blood of the covenant. Throughout scripture, the killing of a sacrifice and the shedding of its blood is used to portray different covenants that God has with man. Jesus Christ, to demonstrate that his covenant is an eternal covenant, shed his blood on Calvary's cross for us. He only had to do it once. It was an infinite sacrifice. In the Old Testament, the priest had to offer continual sacrifices Day after day, week after week, month after year, month and year after year, especially on the day of Yom Kippur, on the day of atonement, when the blood sacrifice was offered for the sins of all the people. Yom Kippur, the day of atonement. It is finished now because Christ offered the final sacrifice. Sanctification extends into eternity past. Sanctification is one of the benefits of election. Sanctification is accomplished through that elective process by the Holy Spirit. Scripture makes it very clear that we are elect to salvation. But not only salvation, but we find sanctification is included as well in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 13. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because, now listen to this carefully, God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation. How anyone can deny choice to salvation is beyond me. That verse is clear. God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation. But the verse does not stop there. Through sanctification of the spirit and belief of the truth. Back there in eternity past when God chose you to salvation, the Holy Spirit was already doing a work of sanctification that is of setting you apart for Christ. In time present, he effectuated that call and that setting apart through the final phrase of that verse and belief of the truth. God chose you. The Holy Spirit set you apart. God irresistibly drew you to himself to the point whereby he gave you eternal life through faith in Christ. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2 tells us, Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, just like we saw over there in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2.13, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus. There we find the results of it. It's the application of the blood of Christ, which as we've seen is the foundation of, of our salvation and sanctification, but it's for the purpose of what? Unto obedience. That's the holy life. That's the life lived in the power of the Spirit of God. You cannot obey in the flesh. In my flesh dwelleth no good thing, says the Apostle Paul. It is only as you yield yourself to the Spirit of God and allow Him to control your life, every aspect of your life, Obedience to the truth. This is Old Testament doctrine as well as new. Before I formed thee in the belly, Jeremiah 1.5, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee and ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Jeremiah hears the same doctrine that is repeated for us in the New Testament. 
It's a work of God the Father as well as of the Holy Spirit, Jude the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James to them, that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. Because we're in Christ, we're sanctified. But our practical sanctification requires a morally pure lifestyle. Do you look at pornography? You look at the perverted stuff that's on the internet. It used to only come in brown paper wrappers back in the 50s and 60s. And people who looked at that kind of stuff were considered really decadent. You watch television. You're seeing a lot of pornography on television. What kind of material do you read for literature? What kind of magazines do you have? If Jesus Christ walked into your home today and looked at the magazines that are scattered around, would there be any pages that you wish were not in those magazines? Pages that you've looked at perhaps more than once? What kind of music do you listen to? Does it glorify Christ? God has called us to a holy life. 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 and 4, For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that is the practical holy life that ye should abstain from fornication. We've only talked about those external things that come into our senses, but when you take your body and use it in a manner which is violating the relationship between Christ and His bride, the church. Oh, dear people, that you should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess His vessel, that is, your body, in sanctification, that is, in holy living and honor. On Friday evening, we talked about different symbolism given to us in the Old Testament. We'll not go over all of that here. But symbolism in the way of the priests, what they did, and the sacrifices that they offered, and we spent a little time on that because the priests had to be holy if they would offer the holy sacrifices. We'll see in a few moments some quotations from the New Testament where it tells us that we are priests unto God and unto Christ. And we are to be worshiping Him in our service. And the sacrifice of thanksgiving, praise from our lips, But one thing we did not talk about that I want to talk about today, and God put that on my heart this morning, even after all of this material was prepared, it's getting to be summertime. It's getting to be summertime. And we as God's people are going to be tempted to dress in an immodest manner. The clothing worn to the service of worship, and that really includes all of life, but certainly when we come here, the clothing worn to the service of worship must be holy clothing. Because you see, the clothing that we wear is a picture of the believer clothed with the righteousness of Christ. The clothing that we wear is a picture of the believer clothed with the righteousness of Christ. Why do you think it was that God provided clothing for Adam and Eve and didn't accept the clothing that they chose for themselves? It was clothing that came from a slain 
animal. Blood had to be shed to clothe them. And blood had to be shed to clothe you with the righteousness of Christ. And the clothing that we wear must be appropriate clothing for what we are doing because it represents the righteousness of Christ. If you come to church immodestly dressed, you're violating this principle. If you come to church wearing clothing that's designed to direct attention to yourself rather than to Christ, you're violating this principle. If you come to church wearing clothing that's the fad of the world and that makes people think of the world rather than of Christ, you are violating this principle. Now, you don't have to be ugly when you come to church. In fact, as we look at the Old Testament, which gives us the first picture of this, it tells us in Exodus 28, verse 2, And thou shalt make holy garments for Aaron thy brother. And he tells the reason for glory and for beauty. For glory, that it might bring glory to God, everything about Aaron's clothing pointed to God in a very special way. We've seen some of that on Sunday evenings. All the way from the mitre on his head with the gold headband that said Kadesh Yahweh, which meant holiness unto the Lord. All the way through the, the stones that were on his shoulders with the twelve tribes names engraved on them. And the breastplate which had the twelve names engraved each on a different stone. And the white linen and the blue, all the way down to the fringes at the bottom. All of it pointed to something about holiness and about serving a righteous God. But it was beautiful clothing. Not to attract attention to Aaron, but to attract attention to God. To remind people that we serve a God of great beauty. Look at the creation around us. I often marvel as I walk through this courtyard outside here, and I suppose it may be silly if someone saw me, but I often stop and smell the roses. They're beautiful. When the flowers were coming up here alongside the church, by the driveway in the spring, I actually took some time to walk around the church and just look at this gorgeous, beautiful creation that God has made. It points not to the flower itself, it points to the Creator. Does your clothing point to a righteous God, a holy God? Does your clothing point to a beautiful God? A God before whom we worship with our very best. Because he is a lovely God. He is everything lovely to us. Oh, do we love him? Do we honor him? Exodus 28, verse 4, two verses later says, These are the garments which they shall make, a breastplate, an ephod, and a robe, and a broidered coat, a mitre, and a girdle, and they shall make the holy garments for Aaron thy brother and his sons, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. Did you notice that list of clothing? Totally covered except for the countenance the hands and the feet. The human body should be clothed modestly. It's unveiling only for those who are in the marriage bond. Our focus should be on our countenance, developing the radiance of Christ that attracts people through the beauty of the countenance that we show forth 
his radiant love and glory. And the cloths of service and the holy garments for Aaron the priest and the garments of his sons to minister in the priest's office. You see, they are ministering priests. That is, they are serving priests. If you've been with us on Sunday evenings, we've been talking about how we serve God in our worship when we gather together. Clothing for those ministering in the priest's office. We are kings and priests unto our God. We find the first prophetic statement of that in the book of Exodus 19.6. Ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. We find it will be finally and perfectly fulfilled as we get to the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 6. And here we find those from every nation of heaven speaking forth and exclaiming, He hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. God has made you a king and a priest. Do you not think that you should wear clothing that physically expresses the divine clothing with which you have been clothed, which is the righteousness of Christ. Revelation 5.10 hath made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Revelation 26, blessed and holy, 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 is he that hath part in the first resurrection on such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. What is it that we should wear? The scripture speaks of the attire of a harlot. No Christian should wear the attire of a harlot. Much the Christian women wear today would certainly, at the time of Solomon writing this, or the time of our Lord Jesus Christ, or the time of the Apostle Paul, would have been considered the attire of a harlot. The kind of clothing that a woman wishing to seduce a man wears so that she reveals the erogenous zones of her body. Proverbs 7, 10, and 11. Behold, there met him a woman with the attire of a harlot and subtle of heart. She is loud and stubborn. Her feet abide not in her house. How many young women are just sort of running around today? Christian young women. Their feet abide not in their house. They're loud and bossy. They're stubborn. They're following the ways of the world. How many Christian young women, and older women too, wear what would have been considered when Solomon wrote this, when our Lord Jesus Christ walked on earth, when the Apostle Paul wrote about the modesty of women, how much of what Christian young women wear today would have been considered at that time to be the attire of a harlot? People, our standard is not based on the fluctuating world around us. You can look at the periods of history where Scripture speaks to find out what would have been considered the attire of an harlot. People, we are a holy people! Shall Christian women dress that way and tempt Christian men to think like the world and fall into sin and come to the Lord's table with unpure hearts? This is wickedness. There's not merely the attire of a harlot. There's the attire of the world. Ezekiel speaks of it. Girded with girdles upon their loins, exceeding in dyed attire upon their heads, all of them princes to look to, after the manner of the Babylonians of Chaldea, the land of their nativity. 
I'm not going to spend this whole sermon talking about clothing, but the Bible says a lot about it. I'm just giving you some basic areas. The attire of a harlot. The attire of the world. So that you would know that this is a rich person in the world. This is a person of worldly ways. But the scripture also speaks of the attire of a bride. And remember, we are the bride of Christ. Can a maid forget her ornaments or a bride her attire? Yet my people have forgotten me. Days without number. How easy it is to forget our heavenly bridegroom. Days without number. What bride forgets the beauty of her wedding day? The jewelry that she wore. The impeccable whiteness and beauty of her dress. Yet my people have forgotten me, says the Lord. And he compares it to clothing. I'll leave this subject at that point. We're talking about holiness in preparation for the Lord's table. It was the responsibility of the Father to sanctify his own family under the doctrine of federal headship. That is, he must lead a holy life if he would have any hope of his family, though they are individually responsible, but of them leading a holy life. Every person was individually held accountable to sanctify himself or herself because they were coming into the presence of a holy God, and I'm skipping over many of the references we covered on Friday night. The means that God uses to sanctify us is the word of God. Jesus said so in John 17, 17, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. And two verses later he says, For their sakes I sanctify myself. Christ sets himself apart because he is setting the example for us. I sanctify myself that they also might be sanctified through thy truth. As you study the scripture and as you apply it, you become more and more like Jesus Christ. Isn't that what you want? To be more like him? Ephesians 5.26, God uses his word to sanctify us, that he might sanctify and cleanse it that is speaking of the church with the washing of water by the word. Sanctification is not merely a theory. Sanctification is what we must put into practice. It includes our heart relationship to God and the outward resulting actions. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready to always give an answer to every man that asketh of you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. 1 Peter 3.15 Sanctification is the foundation of our heavenly inheritance. We'll not speak of that now. Sanctification is by faith in Christ alone. Sanctification gives us freedom from the ritual restrictions of the Old Testament law. Practical sanctification is required for service. Because you see, God does not use dirty vessels. The vessels that were used in the temple and the tabernacle were clean vessels. They were set apart and cleansed for service. And Paul picks up that theme as he writes to young Timothy in what are called the pastoral epistles. 2 Timothy 2, 19 through 22. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his, those who are elect, God knows. You and I don't know who all of them are, but he certainly does. But the second half of that verse is what draws our attention. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. It's a word for moral uncleanness. That's what we're dealing with when we're dealing with holiness when we're dealing with sanctification. In a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. Now listen to the next verse. If a man therefore purge himself 
from these. That is from these works of iniquity. Purge means to make clean. If a man therefore shall purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor. Do you want to be honored by the Lord? A vessel that is used for things that are honorable. If a man therefore shall purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use. Sanctified, set apart, holy, pure, clean, and neat, fitting, appropriate, properly prepared for the master's use. Do you want to be used by Christ? Then you must live a holy life. And prepared unto every good work. Flee also youthful lusts, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Dear people, we're coming to the Lord's table. I know this is a long sermon. And if you're sitting there thinking about how long the sermon is, your heart is not ready for the Lord's table. God has put this on my heart that there must be a cleansing here. God has called us to be a holy people because he is a holy God. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. Oh, how we long to serve God with reverence and godly fear. And it extends to our conscience how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge, that is make clean and right and holy, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And as we gather for fellowship, we are reminded that we are having fellowship with our Lord Jesus Christ as well as with one another. You read my communion letter. I hope you did. Communion speaks of fellowship. We're gathering around this table for fellowship with one who is willing to call us his brethren. Hebrews 2.11 For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. We're gathering with the one who is willing, because he has made us holy by his blood, the one who is willing to call us brethren. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for your marvelous and powerful word, how we thank you that we are sanctified by the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. We're sanctified by his blood. Oh, Father, as we gather here before you, in your presence, in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is indeed the head of this table, we come confessing our sins, knowing that you're faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Father, we pray for your blessings upon this time of fellowship that we have one with another now and with our Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray that you would make us a holy people, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.